We're going to look at uh, Leo Tolstoy's death of Ivan Illich today and uh, move thus from the Anglosphere uh, to uh, Russia, and uh, which is quite a different social, political, cultural context. It's still uh, European, uh, but in many ways, while the Industrial Revolution and the uh, British Empire is the context for the work that we just looked at, and um, and modernity is there in the uh, in the novels of um, the the works that we've looked at, and also even in uh, uh, Tennyson. Uh, here in Russian literature, we have a different context. It's very much of still an aristocratic and feudal society. It has not yet been marked by the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Russia in the 19th century is very uh, economically backwards uh, in that sense. And although there, but it has had some influences from Western Europe, largely because of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon uh, marched all the way to the uh, gates of Moscow, and um, I think you can see the influence of the French um, rationalism in Russian literature. For some, it's something that they aspire to. For others, that they regard as anti-Russian and something to be deplored. In general, the um, great authors tend to fall in the latter camp. They think there's something that is uh, not very progressive at all about uh, the French and the en Enlightenment way of looking at things and prefer the um, old Russian th uh, approaches and understandings. Uh, Tolstoy is one of the famed authors of this culture. He'll know Dostoevsky as well, but Leo Tolstoy, the author of War and Peace and Anna Karenina, uh, among others, uh, is certainly probably the most famous. Certainly War and Peace, some think, is the greatest novel uh, ever written. Uh, so he's born in 1828, and he is a nobleman himself. So comes from an aristocratic family with a big family estate. Um, but this is the golden age of Russian literature, 19th century. So not long after he's born, uh, born Pushkin is publishing uh, Eugene Onyegin, which is put into a ballet as well. But it's a great Russian. Uh, work of literature, but Tolstoy is born in 1828, he dies in 1910. So during that time, the Industrial Revolution is taking hold in, in Britain and transforming the country, but it's not coming to Russia. Uh, Russia remains backwards, so when Tolstoy dies, uh, the First World War has not yet come, um, but Russia is still largely an agrarian society, so it's got a lot of farmland and uh, there's still an ar aristocracy that uh, runs the country more or less, uh, and a lot of peasant farmers. Uh, the death of Ivan Illich is probably the most popular uh, of his shorter novellas. So this isn't a novel that we're looking at, it's a novella. And it's probably uh, popular because Tolstoy helps us to sympathize with, uh, with Ivan because he represents, Ivan represents a sort of class of individual that still exists, the uh, upwardly mobile middle class. And everyone aspires to be middle class these days. Even the aristocrats apparently aspire to be middle class. Harry's <laughs> laid down his... <laughs> Uh, title as prince in order just to be Harry uh, and uh, to be able to make his own money. Well, these are middle class ambitions. He doesn't even want to be uh, royal. Um, so that idea of, of making your own way in the world and getting um, ascending the career ladder and uh, becoming known for your own exploits, that's, that's the context for the story. And it's not just for Ivan, it's the whole of the Russian society they portray here. So he has, even though the Industrial Revolution hasn't happened, that doesn't mean that there isn't 
there aren't people who are trying to uh, make a better life for themselves. And in, in Russia, this would largely take place in the big cities, like in Moscow and, and St. Petersburg in particular. But definitely those two. And to this day in Moscow, uh, if you're going to live in the city, you actually have to have uh, permission to live in the city. You require a certain uh, stamp on your passport, your papers, to, to be residing in the city. You can work in the city, but to live there, you actually need permission from the authorities to do that. So there still is this, um, the importance of the city and the life of the country is uh, evident to this very day. But the death of Ivan Illich is interesting because uh, the title announces what the novella is about. It's about the man's death. And uh, death is a theme, uh, a perennial theme in literature, but it's not usually the theme that you begin a story with. It's usually the one that ends the story, right? Um, we looked last semester, at least in my class, at uh, the uh, dramatic work Everyman, the anonymous work. Remember the medieval play about a man who's summoned to die by, you know, death. God sends death to uh, apprehend every man and tell him it's his, you know, the hour's here for you now. And he says, I'm not ready to die yet. And so he uh, begs for time and death says, you don't get more time. <laughs> when your time has come, that's it. And then, of course, he does give him time. And then he does all the things that you'll need to prepare for death. And it's a way for the, whoever the author was to teach his audience, you need to be ready for that one statistic in life that everybody fulfills the perfect statistic, which is death. Everybody who lives dies. And in um, actuarial science and in your, for life insurance, they have something called a countdown calculator. You ever heard of a countdown calculator? I don't know if they call it that still. But they have something of the equivalent of it. And it is they will take your, particularly in the air, a, uh, days of, of artificial intelligence, they have a algorithm that will take in all of your measurable statistics. So your, your sex, your uh, racial background, your social economic status, your uh, lifestyle habits, you know, are you a drinker? Are you a smoker? Um, did your parents suffer from cancer? At what age? What are the recurrence of cancer, this particular type of cancer? They'll take all of those things into consideration. And then based on that, they will tell you when you're going to die. Whether you know it or not, the insurance companies will have a statistic somewhere that will tell them at what stage you're going to die. And then based on that, number, they will uh, give you insurance based on the risk of you dying before that time. So if you're in an occupation that's very hazardous, obviously the possibility of your life ending earlier is much younger. But remember, insurance companies are there to make money, so they don't want to insure people who have life-threatening illnesses. Or if they are going to, then they're going to charge you a great deal of money, and it's basically uh, based on whatever number that is, will give you money up until that age. So if you are, uh, the threat of your death appears to us by statistics to be coming very soon, sure, we'll give you insurance, but you have to pay a huge sum of money because the risks are that we're going to have to pay out. At any rate, <coughs> that idea of life being measurable, we've al also looked at in uh, th this uh, semester with uh, uh, a modest proposal and so forth. So death is there in, as a theme uh, and something that people try to control is also there as a theme. Uh, here it becomes a little different uh, because the death, the, the meaning of death overarches the whole novella. So it's just not just called that and it doesn't just start with the death of Ivan because that's how the story begins. We don't even see him alive, he's already dead. That's how it begins. And then it backtracks to how we got to that point. But it begins with the death, and in a way that makes it, um, its importance is heightened in a way that you almost find in no other literary work, or at least not to the same uh, 
success as far as I'm concerned. Um, and it, what, what it does, and this is interesting, is it highlights the existential importance of death in a person's life. Right? That in our day, even though I said there's a countdown calculator, the insurance companies are measuring and um, their risk and therefore the cost of insurance uh, of insuring you. Um, at the same time, nobody talks about death in our culture. When somebody dies, people are shocked if they die early, right? If they die in their 90s and they die of an illness that they've had for a long time, people are sad, but they're not surprised. Whereas if somebody dies when they're young, it's, it's almost like, but that's not how it's supposed to happen, right? And if a, if a child dies ahead of their parents, people are saying that there's something unnatural about this. Uh, also, I've, I've asked the class before and I've asked it over the years, has anyone ever seen anyone die? And I've often had the response of no. Has anyone here seen anyone die? Not one of you, which is extraordinary. At, at, at certain eras and ages in human history, you would have seen somebody die regularly, either in war or even just ordinary life, because people who were sick lived in your midst, right? If you had a sick parent or grandparent, they would be in your house and they would die in your house. Nowadays, they go into a hospital. Right, and then the experts look after them. They're sequestered away, and then you don't even see them. Um, so we we're, we distance ourselves from it. And to some degree, what's interesting here is Tolstoy is actually talking a little bit about that, because part of it is there are people who look after people who are sick, and so we'll we'll give them over to the experts. But there's another part of it, which is that people don't want to face death. And I think that's part of the reason why we put even our own families in places where they're going to die, it's to not face it ourselves. And that is really what Tolstoy is talking about, the cumulative effect of avoiding the inevitable. And that's what Ivan Illich himself sought to do as a young man. He never wanted to face the reality of death, that it was coming for him. So some people think that, in fact, that's the whole purpose of the death of Ivan Illich is, is a sort of a moral fiction to instruct the audience on how to live. I think that there's something to that. Um, so let me have a look at this here. Um, first, first chapter. By the way, the structure of the uh, novella is very interesting. It goes on for 12 chapters. And the first four chapters span 40 years. The second four chapters um, take a few months. And the final four chapters take a few weeks. So what you get in this, even though, and I will say also the chapters start getting shorter and shorter. So if you, if you think about the effect of doing that when you're reading it, is you get a sense, which you may have now as well, because most of you are in your 20s, um, or even late teens. When you're young, uh, the years are long, like the summers are long. As you get older, Chrono chronologically, the, the days don't change and the years don't change. But in terms of your experience, the years start to go more quickly. It's just, everyone will say that. They'll say, my, the years just flew by. Uh, there's an exception to that, and that's when you suffer sickness or pain. Then the time drags. It goes on long. Um, I think the way Tolstoy does it here is to suggest, uh, is to actually enhance his theme about how people, when they're young, it's easy for them to avoid the idea that mortality applies to them, like they're going to die, 
even when they're young, even if they're not thinking about it. Death is something they need to be prepared for, and it will meet them whether they're young or old. So that's the first thing. But I, this, this uh, spatial temporal framework, so four chapters for 40 years, then four chapters for several months, and then four chapters for a few short weeks, in some ways um, enhances his theme uh, of uh, uh, not just the time but even space because at first in those first 40 years he travels around a lot. Ivan goes from here to this place to that place, spends a lot of time traveling. Uh, when he, uh, the dividing line that for chapter 5 is when he falls and you can see that as a metaphor. He falls down a ladder and he injures his side. It didn't even seem like it was that bad, but it's an injury. It doesn't go away. And when that happens, then he's no longer traveling because he's not well. If you're not well, you don't travel. He stays in his house. In the final four weeks, final four chapters rather, he doesn't get off his bed. So he's bedridden or couch ridden as the case may be. He's not, he's not moving. So it's still the same four chapters. Uh, in terms of the, the space of the telling of it, but in terms of his location, he's now stuck. And if you can think about that, and it's hard for you to imagine when you're able-bodied and young, that there may come a time when you're just as human, but you're not actually able to do anything. You're stuck in a bed, or you have trouble getting outside, or moving around. Um, and yet, and, and people forget about you. Because what are they doing? They're doing the very same things that you used to do in these first four chapters, which is you're traveling around a lot, you're busy, you're trying to make a way for yourself in the world, and you're trying to avoid the reality of those last four chapters. Uh, so chapter one is interesting because what it does is it established a, a contrast in the different attitudes towards life. So, because that's really what the issue is. It's not just about death, but how we reckon for the meaning of death within the context of life. So it's a, uh, it's a philosophical novel, but it's also religious in its themes. So now, what is the meaning of life? In light of the fact that people die and we think that there's a significance to death, how should we live? So I'll begin, I'll just read some of the first lines of the novella here. Uh, Tolstoy begins with, inside the great building of the law courts, during the interval in the hearing of the, the Melvinsky case, the members of the judicial council and the public prosecutor were gathered together in the private room of Ivan Yegorovich Shebek, and the conversation turned upon the celebrated Krasovsky case. Fyodor Vasilyevich hotly maintained that the case was not in the jurisdiction of the court. Igor Ivanovich stood up for his own view, but from the first, Peter Ivanovich, who had not entered into the discussion, took no interest in it, but was looking through the newspapers which had been, put, which had been brought in. Gentlemen, he said, Ivan Ilyich is dead. You don't say so. Here, read it, he said to Fyodor Vasilyevich, handing him the fresh, still damp smelling paper. By the way, in uh, older newspapers, they used to be uh, uh, print, so they're typeset on pieces of paper, and the ink was still often, if it came hot off the press, it was still wet. And the ink would bleed out of it. So if you put, you know, if you put your hand on it, you could have ink stains on your hands not the way nowadays because the uh, technology is different. Uh, but it's, and it's, so it's still wet from the smell of the type and the ink being placed on the paper. Uh, within a black margin was printed Praskovia Fyodorovna Golovin with heartfelt affliction informs friends and relatives of the deceased of her or of the decease of her beloved husband, member of the Court of Justice, Ivan Ilyich Golovin who passed away on the 4th of February. 
The funeral will take place on Thursday at one o'clock. Now the narrator. Ivan Illich was a colleague of the gentleman present and all liked him. It was some weeks now since he had been taken ill. His illness had been said to be incurable. His post had been kept open for him, but it had been thought that in case of his death, Alexeyev, Alexeyev might receive his appointment, and either Vinnikov or Stabel would succeed to Alexeyev's. So everybody's thinking about what's going to happen when he dies, who's going to take his place, because there's a hierarchy in the law firm. So it's thought that uh, Alexeyev will get his job and then the others will get come into Alexeyev's position. So that on hearing of Ivan Illich's death, the first thought of each of the gentlemen in the room was of the effect this death might have on the transfer or promotion of themselves or their friends. So note the immediate selfish response. Now it's not that they don't say this, it's within their heads. The narrator is telling us this is what they're thinking. And note what they're thinking is about their own movement. There's no reflections on what a terrible thing death is. It actually offers an opportunity for them. So it's an immediately, they receive it positively. Of course, you can't express that, but that's their thoughts. Now, now I am sure of getting Stabel's place or Vinnikov's thought, Fyodor Vasilyevich. It was promised me, so this is third down in the ranks, it was promised me long ago, and the promotion means 800 rubles additional income, besides the grants for office expenses. Now I shall have to petition for my brother-in-law to be transferred from Kaluga, thought Peter Ivanovich. My wife will be very glad. She won't be able to say now that I've never done anything for her family. I thought somehow that he'd never get up from his bed again, Peter Ivanovich said aloud. I'm sorry, but what was it exactly that was wrong with him? The doctors couldn't decide. That's to say they did decide, but differently. <laughs> when I saw him last, I thought he would get over it. Well, I positively haven't called uh, there ever since the holidays. I've been meaning to go. Had he any property? Oh, I think something small, very small, of his wife's, but something quite trifling. Yes, one will have to go and call. They live such a terribly long way off. A long way for you, you mean. Everything's a long way from your place. Now that comment is um, identifying that this fellow is not as wealthy as they are because he's further away from the center. So all of this, in the midst of this news, we have a lot of people thinking about how they're going to get closer to the center of things and be socially better regarded. And even in their conversations with one another, they're putting one another in their place and they're thinking about their wives and how they will be. So everybody's thinking about it in purely selfish terms. And they're saying something about, well, we've got to go visit because that's the socially approved thing to do to show our respect, but none of them actually wants to go. It's just something that they ought to do. Everything's a long way from your place. And now the other, th now this is all internal monologue, by the way. There, he can never forgive me for living the other side of the river, said Peter Ivanovich, smiling at, Sh <laughs> at Sh Shebek. And they began to talk of the great distances between different parts of the town and went back into the court. Besides the reflections upon the changes and promotions in the service likely to ensue from his death, the very fact of the death of an intimate acquaintance excited in everyone who heard of it, as such a fact always does, a feeling of relief that it is he that is dead and not I. So within, let me just stop just for a second there. Note within a few pages there, I think what Tolstoy does is establishes, uh, and I think in a quite a plausible dialogue, exactly what goes on uh, to this very day, which is the uh, wicked selfish thoughts that occur to every person. So it's a very realistic novel in that, novella in that sense. 
we're not giving idealized characters. The other thing I want you to note, which uh, you might not notice right away because it's very common in fiction of our day, but it's not historically, is that we're being given the character's thoughts. And we have not seen that up to this point. Yeah, up to this point in writing, if we would read novels before this, we would see it in novels. But in general, what we get in novels is what's going on inside people's heads being told to the reader. We don't get that in classical works of literature. We get people saying things, not what they're thinking, but what they say. Now what they say can be very different than what they think. And so the discrepancy between, and everyone realizes that, you can say one thing but you mean another, or you can say one thing but you're thinking something else. There, the artist, whoever the author is, has to convey that in a different way. And uh, some of it can be observing what they did when they said it. So he said, you know, I promise you, and, and then the author tells us he had his fingers crossed behind his back, so he's lying or whatever. Whatever. There are ways of conveying that the, that the characters, whatever they're saying, are not being truthful, for instance. But what is, what is clear in that is in the older literature, everything is in the foreground. Or rather, no, I shouldn't say that. It's the other way around. It's, it, there's a foreground of what is said, but then there's a background of what is really going on in the story. Think about the parables. Like, think of the parable of the prodigal son. Where that we, we've got father, we've got two sons. The youngest son comes to his father and says, I want my inheritance right now. The father's still alive, right? So inheritance is something you get when your parents die, not when he's alive. So it's, a, it's an appalling thing to do. It's to wish your father to be dead before he's dead. So he's a bad, he's a bad son. The second son stays around. What's not being said is what's going on inside all of their heads. But there's a sense, I think, even in that parable, I'm just choosing that one because you'll know it, uh, there's a sense that we, we can imagine what's going on in the characters' heads. There. The hurt of the father, um, the, uh, probably the anger from the elder brother, which is borne out later in the text, um, and even the character of the son in this is very, his, his greed is right front and center. So he's the sort of, and we can imagine that, and the characters are realistic in that sense. But we're sort of looking into the background to explain. Let me give another illustration. When Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac, you imagine that, remember, um, God promises Abraham that he'll have a son, and the son will be, uh, the f that he'll be the father of many nations, and from your son, you know, from your seed, all nations will be blessed. And he doesn't have a son. He doesn't have any children for decades. He's in his, I think he's 99 before he has a kid. And then when he has the boy, so now he finally gets the boy, and the boy's now, it's decades later, and he says, I want you to go sacrifice your son. What's going on through Abraham's head? We don't know. It, nothing is said. There's no, says so God says, I want you to go do this. And then it says, early the next morning, he got up and he went. Okay, now put yourself in Abraham's place. You can imagine. It's not just, it's your only son. It's you, the son that's going to be, uh, that you've been living your whole life, believing God, thinking that there's something very important about this boy. <coughs> and now you're being asked, so there's a thousand things going on inside of his head. But we don't, we're not told about any of them. Compare that to this, where everything the characters are thinking is being presented to us. Now, the reason that it, it is effective to some degree is because most of us live a lot of our life inside our heads as well, right? We don't say everything that's on our minds, but there's a lot going on there. At least there should be a lot going on inside your heads, right? And that's a real place, that that's a genuine place where people live their lives. They're thinking a lot. There are anxieties. Uh, there are thoughts and their aspirations. All of them are inside and sometimes they're expressed. The Bible and ancient literature tend to put it in the foreground. Those, uh, a person's thoughts and his actions are, 
are connected. Here, it's more, it's a more of an internal world and there's less action. So that's one of the things I want to note here about the way the different mode of depiction is that in modern novels and modern stories in general, there it, it's, it's less of an active world and more of an intellectual world, which is why some people really like modern literature and why some people really hate it. And I'm with the latter. I don't find that the internalized world of characters' minds is very interesting to read. I would rather hear about Odysseus and Achilles and the Knights of the Round Table and action. And when they speak, the speeches are stirring and things are going, I prefer that. And the, and the actions are filled with meaning, of course, particularly if you get Abraham or stories like that. But it's, there's something going on. Whereas here, well, there's nothing going on. It's the death of someone. I just wanted you to, to observe that because it's a big, big shift and it probably comes along with the, the novel and with mass society, modern society, where people don't do much, they just live and they interact with one another. Now a lot can happen in that context, but if you ever read a Jane Austen novel, it's usually some women in a house talking and reflecting on social etiquette and so forth. So it bores the pants off some people. Other people think this is, this is magnificent. And it's all about very small little details, right? Did you see the way he tipped his hat? And did you say the way he looked at her? You would never get that in an ancient story. Do you see the way he looked at her? Just like, that's small. Well, not, so we focus on minutia and it's internalized. So very, it's a very different uh, form of uh, artistry and also uh, the effect is different. But, but Tolstoy is a master at this. So he gets into the psychology of the characters. So modern novels tend to be more psychological in nature. And it suits some people more than others, I think. And I would say, in general, it suits female readers more than men. That's a generalization. But, he, but, but he's very good at it. So he says, uh, everyone uh, had the feeling of relief that it's he that is dead and not I. And I think he's probably correct. This is exactly what goes on when somebody dies. There's that part of it. But look at what's expressed in that. The dread of death. Right? So the announcement of the death of Ivan, who's a colleague that they allegedly like, is a, a, a sense of relief that it's not me. Now that same sense, that selfishness, which Tolstoy identifies, was also true of Ivan Illich, by the way. And we're going to see, there's a, there, I said there's a different perspective on that, and that's in a different character. We'll come to that character in a minute. But as they come in, uh, we're told the most, in, I'll just read on here the first chapter. The most intimately acquainted with their late colleague were Fyodor Vasilyevich and Peter Ivanovich. Peter Ivanovich had been a comrade of his at the School of Jurisprudence and considered himself under obligations to Ivan Illich. Telling his wife at dinner of the news of Ivan Illich's death and his reflections as to the possibility of getting her brother transferred into their circuit, Peter Ivanovich, uh, without lying down for his usual nap, put on his frock coat and drove to Ivan Illich's. And at the entrance, before Ivan Illich's flat, stood a carriage and two hired flies. Downstairs in the entry near the, heart, near the hat stand, there was leaning against the wall a coffin lid with tassels and braiding freshly rubbed up with pipe clay. Two ladies were taking off their cloaks. One of them he knew, the sister of Ivan Illich. The other was a lady he did not know. Peter Ivanovich's colleague, Schwarz, that sounds like the German word for black, by the way, Schwarz was coming down and from the top stair seeing who it was who it was coming in he stopped and winked at him as though to say Ivan Illich has made a mess of it it's a very different matter with you and me now what's going on here Schwarz and Peter play cards regularly 
and they have a they're, they're, uh, have a prior engagement to play cards this evening, but now there's been this unfortunate death that's got in the way of their game of cards. And they're immediately like schoolboys, they're sort of winking at one another, oh, there's this death, we have to be here for this, but we can get back to the gaming thing a little later on, but let's go through the motions here now. Um, Schwarz's face with his English whiskers and all his thin figure in his frock coat had, as it always had, an air of elegant solemnity. And this solemnity, always such a contrast to Schwarz's playful character, had a special piquancy here. So thought Peter Ivanovich. He lets the lady pa ladies pass in front of him and walk slowly up the stairs. Schwarz had not come down, but was waiting at the top. So note in what we're getting here, uh, I'll continue on with what I said, a lot of internal monologue and a lot of descriptive scene setting. A lot. Whereas if you look at a biblical narrative or you look at even classical narrative, the narrative, a lot of it is dialogue. One character speaking, another character responding. Here it's the description of the scene so that we can visualize it in our mind's eye if we're the reader, or we can listen to what the characters are thinking inside their head. So it's very different, like it's totally different, night and day. Which one of them is more effective? I think the biblical myself. Uh, more generally. But it's, but it, it's to say here, and this is more long-winded as well. Novels go on for not just hundreds of pages, but sometimes thousands of pages, because their canvas is the human mind and the human psyche and the description of scenes. And if you have an imagination, you're, you're being given a lot of detail. So we're told here that uh, Schwarz is at the top of the stairs. He's, he's, a, he's very thin. He's got English whiskers. He's wearing black, all those. So you have to visualize those things. Uh, those sort of details are very rare and lacking in ancient literature. They're not interested in those sorts of things. So let me give you another example. Do you know what Jesus looks like from the basis of the gospel accounts? Any an idea? Is he ever described? What did Jesus look like? I shouldn't have let you pause because there's no description at all. None. You have no idea. Um, no physical description. Whatsoever. We know he's a man. We know he's Jewish. Uh, so whatever we want to make of that, the author doesn't make anything of it. Not interested in those sorts of details. But whereas this, great deal of interest in those sorts of details. Uh, the other thing I'd say, I'm going to make more of this next, when we talk about this next time, the death of Jesus Christ also is very prominent in the gospel accounts. It's... Um, at least half of the Gospels are caught up with the events of uh, Easter week and the death and resurrection. So huge amount of the narrative is caught up in the death, but it comes at the end. Right? But it's still the meaning of the death is, is huge for the Gospel writers, uh, which is surprising because normally in a biographical account, which is the way you could look at a Gospel, Right, because it's telling about Jesus' life. Uh, the, the death of the character is usually at the very end, and it's over, it's over. I mean, obviously, Jesus doesn't just die, he rises from the dead, so this is a significant difference. But still, it's just the quantity of text that the authors devote to that uh, event which makes it so significant. A lot is talked about in Jesus' death. In fact, it seems to be more important than his life just from the quantity of time that it takes to talk about that event. And of course it is. It's the symbol of the Christian faith, right? The cross on which he died. But he, so here it serves a different function. Uh, death here. But so let me back to the text. Uh, Peter Ivanovich went in as people always do on such occasions in uncertainty as to what he would have to do there. One thing he felt sure of that crossing him oneself never comes amiss on such occasions. So Tolstoy's also had a comic touch. In, uh, in 
uh, Russian Orthodoxy, they cross themselves three times. And they do it the opposite way to the Catholics, by the way. So in terms of the hand motion. Um, and he has no idea what to do because he's superficially religiously observant, but he's not actually faithful. But he knows that somebody's died, so I ought to be pious and reverent, and here's how one demonstrates that. I'm going to cross myself. So he crosses himself a lot. And he says, as to whether it was necessary to bow down while doing so, he did not feel quite sure, and so chose a middle course. Now, this is funny. So he's bowing, and he's sort of He's sort of half bowing and he's definitely doing a lot of crossing and it's all to show reverence, a reverence which he doesn't actually feel, but knows that he ought to demonstrate. So he's going through the motions. And as far as the movements of his hands and head permitted him, he glanced while doing so about the room. So not only is he doing a lot of hand movement and bowing, he's also looking around while he's doing it rather than his head down. I think it's rather amusing. Um, and two young men, one a high school boy, nephews probably, were going out of the room crossing themselves. An old lady was standing motionless and a lady with her eyebrows queerly lifted was saying something to her in a whisper. A deacon in a frock coat, resolute and hearty, was reading something aloud with an expression that precluded all possibility of contradiction. A young peasant who used to wait at table Gerasim, walking with light footsteps in front of Peter Ivanovich, was sprinkling something on the floor, the floor. Seeing this, Peter Ivanovich was at once aware of the faint odor of the decomposing corpse. On his last visit to Ivan Illich, Peter Ivanovich had seen this peasant in his room. He was performing the duties of a sick nurse, and Ivan Illich liked him particularly. Peter Ivanovich continued crossing himself and bowing in a direction intermediate between the coffin, the deacon, and the holy pictures on the table in the corner. In Russian Orthodoxy, they put icons up in their places of worship. You know what I mean by an icon? You know what I mean by an icon? Let's see if I can bring one in next time. They tend to be pictures of, of Jesus or the Trinity or Jesus and his mother. Uh, they're not um, meant to be uh, descriptive portraits, or they are in some ways, but they're not um, very exact in their likeness. They're anyway, the dead man. The dead man lay as dead men always do lie in a peculiarly heavy dead way. <laughs> his stiffened limbs sunk in the cushions of the coffin, and his head bent back forever on the pillow and thrust up, as dead men always do, his yellow waxen forehead with bald spots on the sunken temples, and his nose that stood out sharply and, as it were, squeezed on the upper lip. He was much changed, even thinner since Peter Ivanovich had seen him. But his face, as always with the dead, was more handsome and, above all, more impressive than it had been when he was alive. On the face was an expression of what had to be done, having been done, and rightly done. Besides this, was, there was an ex in that expression a reproach or a reminder for the living. This reminder seemed to Peter Ivanovich uncalled for, or at least to have nothing to do with him. He felt something unpleasant. And so Peter Ivanovich once more crossed himself hurriedly, and as it struck him, too hurriedly, not quite in accordance with the proprieties, turned and went to the door, and Schwartz is waiting for him. Okay. So all of this, uh, you, get, you get a pretty clear visual image of what's going on here, of the, the people, their thoughts, and a lot of attention over several pages to the immediate response. And note that the immediate response is uh, as uh, I just read, the characters to uh, not really want to face what they are confronted with, a dead body. And the face which looks at him, he finds almost a reproach. Well, the reproach doesn't come from the face. It comes from his own conscience, but he doesn't want to address his own conscience. He wants to avoid it.
And I said that there were differing uh, attitudes towards the death. Uh, I'll skip over uh, Praskovia uh, Fyodorovna here, but th this is the widow. She's also there, uh, along with Peter Ivanovich, and and uh, and she, for her part, uh, is as little moved by the part or the the loss of her husband as the other characters are. She wants to know whether she's going to profit from this. So nobody really seems, and they all said to have liked him, she's married to him, seemed to be particularly moved by the passing of a man from their life. In fact, the one thing that they do respond to, and this is a common response, is to wish to avoid reflecting on it as it applies to them. And on uh, a few pages down, uh, it, it says, uh, he asks um, Peter Ivanovich, did he suffer very much? These are polite questions, right? Oh, awfully, says uh, his widow. For the last moments, hours indeed, he never left off screaming. For three days and nights in succession, he screamed incessantly. It was insufferable. I can't understand how I bore it. One could hear it through three closed doors. Ah, what I suffered. <laughs> you get So, her husband's dying. He's in screaming agony for three days. And how does she respond to it? Close the door, close the door, close the door. Three closed doors between them to avoid being anywhere near him and anywhere near the death that's coming and away from his agony. She was distancing herself and all she can comment on, she's saying he's suffering, his suffering was, a, was a, uh, the context for her to complain about how much she suffered and why did she suffer? Because she had to hear him. Bitter stuff. And was he really conscious? Asked Peter Ivanovich. Yes, she whispered, up to the last minute. He said goodbye to us a quarter of an hour before his death and asked Volodya to be taken away too. And now the narrator. The thought of the sufferings of a man he had known so intimately, at first as a lighthearted boy, a schoolboy, then grown up as a partner at whist, card game, in spite of the unpleasant consciousness, consciousness of his own and this woman's hypocrisy, suddenly horrified Peter Ivanovich. He saw again that forehead, the nose that seemed squeezing the lip, and he felt frightened for, him, for himself. Three days and nights of awful suffering and death, why? That may at once any minute come upon me, too, he thought, and he felt for an instant terrified. But immediately, he could not himself have said how, there came to his support the customary reflection that this had happened to Ivan Illich and not to him, and that to him this must not and could not happen, that in thinking thus he was giving way to depression which was not the right thing to do, as was evident from Schwartz's expression of face. And making these reflections, Peter Ivanovich felt reassured and began with interest inquiring details about Ivan Illich's end, as, as though death were a mischance peculiar to Ivan Illich and not, but not at all incidental to himself. So note this, the ways in which a person rationalizes not thinking about a horrible event and applying it to themselves. So what he is, what he's narrating here is uh, what in in scripture would would be called a fool. Wisdom literature uh, talks about the outcome of a person's life. You can either be a fool or you can be wise, and the. Uh, what constitutes a foolish life, what constitutes a wise life, is depending on the outcome of that life. It's not seen from the 
the beginning point seen from the end point, where will you be at the end of your life? Will you be counted as wise or will you be counted as a fool? Well, how will you live your life in light of that fact? Like, because you're go the, your life is like steps along a road. Are you going towards being a wise person are you or are you walking towards being a fool? This man, by ignoring the fact that death is coming to him as well one day, is demonstrating that he's a fool. And it's not just him, it's everybody there. And they're even, they're even aware of their own hypocrisy. Uh, the word hypocrisy, by the way, which we get from uh, scripture, means an actor. Remember Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites? It's the, uh, hypocrite is the Greek word for an actor. Uh, the hypo here from like a hypodermic, it goes underneath your skin. Dermis is your skin. A hypodermic needle goes underneath your skin. Um, so it's under and krites here are the spectators, the, those that are looking down in a theater and judging the performance down below them. So it's under the judgment. A hypocrite is an actor that other people are looking down upon. I don't mean down upon in a moral sense, but they're just watching what they're doing. So these people are acting for the people that are looking on above them, or in this case, around them. So when Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites, he's saying that you're just putting on a superficial appearance, whereas inside, you're nothing like that. It's the exact opposite. So they, re they recognize, interestingly, that they are hypocrites. Their own hearts have convicted them of this. But they don't respond to that by changing their life. So they continue to walk along the path of, of folly. Now there's a different character here that we just met and it's a character that we spend very little time on until the very end of the chapter. And let me come to that character now and his name is Gerasim. which is a very funny name, it doesn't sound very Russian. And I wonder what in Russian the connotations of that would be. Uh, for me, I wonder whether uh, it's supposed to sound like the, uh, the madman in the uh, Gospels the, that was uh, at Gerasim. He was demon possessed. He was chained up because he would attack people. So they chained him. And Jesus comes along because this man is, uh, because he's so violent in his madness that, uh, that he's attacking everybody. And when Jesus comes to him and he speaks to him and asks him his name, he said, my name is Legion because we are many. Right, you remember that passage? And that's at Gerasene. So I'm wondering if there's a connection. So here's a man that by the lights of his contemporaries is crazy and mad and dangerous in some ways. He's distasteful to them. But this man who appears by their lights to be crazy is, is in some ways Tolstoy's hero. Because how does he respond to this? By the way, the Gerasene demoniac, Jesus, uh, in response to him, he casts out the demons from them and causes them to go into a flock or like a uh, group of pigs and then the pigs go down to the water and drown, right? And then the villagers come along and they tell Jesus to get lost. Remember the, like it's an interesting passage. Why do they tell Jesus to get lost? He healed the Gerasene demoniac, like he's in his right mind at the end of that. This is a good thing. But the villagers aren't happy. Well, why? Probably because they're pig farmers. These were their pigs. And he just killed the pigs. So you're not welcome here. You're bad for the, you're bad for the economy. Go away, Jesus. You know? Yeah, you might be helping people, but, you know, our pigs are all dead. Pigs are an unclean animal as well. So there's all sorts of stuff going on there if you're going to preach on that text. But, but here Gerasene is a, a contrary figure. He's, he's the only character 
who is different from the crowd here. So let me look at this at the end. So the end of chapter uh, one, which is the longest chapter. In the dining room, where there where was the bric-a-brac clock that Ivan Illich had always been so delighted at buying, Peter Ivanovich met the priest and several people he knew who had come to the service for the dead and saw too Ivan Illich's daughter, a, a handsome young lady. She was all in black. Her very slender figure looked even slenderer than usual. She had a gloomy, determined, almost wrathful expression. She bowed to Peter Ivanovich as though he were to blame in some way. Why is she angry at him? He's alive, her father's dead. He's now going to be promoted when her father has lost, who knows? My father cared more to spend his time with you than he did with me, and I resent it. I, again, who knows? Behind the daughter, with the same offended air on his face, stood a rich young man. Now, that's almost a biblical description. Whom Peter Ivanovich knew too, an examining magistrate, the young lady's fiancé, as he had heard. He bowed dejectedly to him and would have gone on into the dead man's room when from the staircase there appeared the figure of the son, the high school boy, extraordinarily like Ivan Illich. He was the little Ivan Illich over again as Peter Ivanovich remembered him at school. His eyes were red with crying and had that look often seen in unclean boys of 13 or 14. <laughs> or five. I have a five-year-old. His face is always dirty. I don't know how they do. They roll around on the ground, I guess. No idea. But the boy, seeing Peter Ivanovich, scowled morosely and bashfully. Peter Ivanovich nodded to him and went into the dead man's room. The service for the dead began. Candles, groans, incense, tears, sobs. Peter Ivanovich stood frowning, staring at his feet in front of him. He did not once glance at the dead man and right through to the end did not once give way to depressing influences and was one of the first to walk out. In the hall there was no one. Gerasim, the young peasant, darted out of the dead man's room, tossed over with his strong hand all the fur cloaks to find Peter Ivanovich and gave it to him. Well, Gerasim, my boy? said Peter Ivanovich, so as to say something, a sad business, isn't it? It's God's will. We shall all come to the same, said Gerasim, showing his white, even, peasant teeth in a smile. And like a man in a rush of extra work, he briskly opened the door, called up the coachman, saw Peter Ivanovich into the carriage, and darted back to the steps as though bethinking himself of what he had to do next. So there you go. Gerasim. So Gerasim's response, he mentions God, first time. There's a religious service, but, but this man personally attributes it to God's will and also then reflects that, it, that they will all be in the same position one day. So he's a very different figure than everyone else. Just in that little dialogue, we're, we'll read more about Gerasim. But already there, he's different. Note that he is looked down upon. He's a peasant. We also found out that he, just from the very first chapter, that he looked after Ivan Illich when he was ill, which his own wife would not do. And as it turns out, his kids would not do. As angry and upset as they are and resentful, they, him, they did not want to be around their father. But, but Gerasim was there. So Gerasim faces death. The others avoid it. Who is the fool? Who is the madman? As I say, his name, Garrison, might suggest that he's crazy. Is he, in fact, crazy? So that's how the, uh, this, the story begins. Uh, it begins with the deathbed, it's not the deathbed, he's already dead with the funeral hall. Um, people talking about that and so forth. Chapter two, as I said, then gives us uh, how we got to this point. 
So the previous history of Ivan Illich was the simplest, the most ordinary, and the most awful. Ivan Illich died at the age of 45, a member of the Judicial Council. He was the son of an official whose career in Petersburg through various ministries and departments had been such uh, as leads people into that position in which, though it is distinctly obvious that they are unfit to perform any kind of real duty, they yet cannot, owing to their long past service and their official rank, be dismissed. <laughs> so he's a bureaucrat, uh, or he is like a bureaucrat. He's somebody who s seems to have no function and yet can't be got rid of. So that, that, now whose description? Well, this is Tolstoy's description. So he's in a position, he's unfit to do any real duty, and yet he can't be dismissed as if he were essential. And he said, and they therefore receive a specially created fictitious post, and by no means fictitious thousands from six to ten, on which they go on living till extreme old age. And Ivan Illich is the second son. And further on down, next paragraph, his duty he considered whatever was so considered by those persons who were set in authority over him. So he has no moral compass. He does what he's told. He's, he's, a, he's an official. But his office is not in doing anything productive. It's in doing his duty. And for that doing of his duty, he is rewarded with wealth and with uh, a career ladder of moving up in the career ladder, but he has no uh, ambitions besides rising up in the career ladder. So he's a, sounds like a lot of people today. Um, I hope that's not the case for you and your education here. You came here to get a degree. I mean, you'll get a degree, but if you're here to get a degree, um, you need to think a little bit more about what you're here to do because the degree hopefully will be the outcome. Uh, but I think we offer a little bit more than the degree at the end of it. Um, we don't even, we're not even very good at uh, preparing people for a career in the sense that there's no, you know, the BA is not going to get you a particular job. It's not, uh, it, it's about, it's reflecting on uh, a meaningful life and how to live it among other things. But Ivan's death, uh, which began the novel, now we, get, we go through a little backtracking back here in the second chapter. And in this uh, second set, uh, or this uh, chapter two, we now find out basically a history from his early beginnings all the way up until uh, he's uh, mature. Um, so he's a sort of a dutiful individual. He's shrewd. Uh, he's considered, oh, this is an interesting title. He's called the Phoenix de la Famille. The Phoenix of the family. What is a Phoenix? People did Harry Potter, so. What's a Phoenix? In the order of the Phoenix of the Phoenix. Like the bird that when it dies, it gets like reborn. It's a mythological bird. There's only one at a time. There are no second birds. It's not going to work now. Um, it, it's a mythological bird that rises from the ashes, it lives, and then it dies, it flames out, and it's gone. I think it comes every 500 years or something like that. So he's the phoenix of the family. He's a rising star. He's going to come from um, a relatively... In, so he's got a lot of promise, whatever that means. Note that the phrase is uh, in French, even in the English translation, but it would have been in the Russian as well, they would have quoted French, because French was the language that the aristocracy in France spoke, interestingly. There's a little bit of irony there as well, because the French Revolution was against the aristocrats. Right? The common people overthrew the king, chopped off his head, the aristocrats were put down, as it were, the common people raised up. Well, in France, the aristocracy speak French, even though they're Russians, whereas the peasants speak Russian. Interesting. Um, but he is a dutiful individual and he's ambitious. So it, it says, um, he was not so frigid and precise as the eldest son, nor so wild as the youngest. He was the happy mean between them, a shrewd, lively, pleasant, and well-bred man. 
He'd been educated with his younger brother at the School of Jurisprudence. The younger brother had not finished the school course, but was expelled when in the fifth class, Ivan Illich completed the course successfully. At school, he was just the same as he was later on all his life, an intelligent fellow, highly good-humored and sociable, but strict in doing what he considered to be his duty. And as I said, his duty, he considered whatever was so considered by those persons who were set in authority over them. So this is interesting. So he, he's dutiful not because he is a moral compass. He's dutiful because it's expected of him. He goes through the motions. It's the way that he gets promotions. That's what it means by being dutiful. Now this is not your traditional sense of being dutiful. That would be being morally aware and acting and doing the right thing. This guy is right, he's a superficial man. He goes through the right motions. He's got the right degrees. He marries uh, a wealthy woman, as it turns out, and gets with her, along with her some of the trappings of her family, some money. And I'll read on a little bit further down. The, only su the persons directly subject to his authority were few. The only such persons were the dis district police superintendents and the dissenters when he was serving on special commissions. And he liked treating such persons affably, almost like comrades, liked to make them feel that he, able to annihilate them, was behaving in this simple, friendly way with them. But such people were then few in number. Now, as an examining magistrate, Ivan Illich felt that everyone, everyone without exception, the most dignified, the most self-satisfied people were all in his hands, and that he had but to write certain words on a sheet of paper with a printed heading, and this dignified, self-satisfied person would be brought before him in the capacity of a defendant or a witness. And if he did not care to make him sit down, he would have to stand up before him and answer his questions. Peter, you know, so Ivan Illich never abused his authority, this authority of his. On the contrary, he tried to soften the expression of it. But the consciousness of his power and the possibility of softening its effect constituted for him the chief interest and attractiveness of his new position. So he's not a bad man. He doesn't, he doesn't abuse his authority by crushing people, but he likes the power. He likes having it, and he likes knowing that he has it, but not using it. So he, he, he is enamored with being in a powerful position. But a decent man, because he's not using it to crush people. So you're getting a sense, a, a picture of this. Now he meets his wife, Praskovia Fyodorovna Mikhail, and it says she was the most attractive, clever, and brilliant girl in the set in which Ivan Illich moved. Among other amusements and recreations after his labors as a magistrate, Ivan Illich started a light, playful flirtation with Praskovia Fyodorovna. By the way, in Russian um, names, they have three. And it's, uh, it's challenging when you're reading Russian literature um, because in addition to the three names, um, some names have multiple variations on them. So the name Elena in Russian, in English Helen, can sometimes be Lena. That's the familiar. It's like a short form. Right? So if you're Elizabeth, it would be Beth, right? Or Liz. So it's Elena. But it can also be so this is if you're on familiar terms. It could also be if you're angry, I'm told, with the character you can, ch and uh, Russian names, depending on which vary, and these are commonly known variations, it will express your attitude towards the character. So if you call it somebody whose name is Elena, Lenorka, you're, you're annoyed with them. For the English speaker, this is very hard in a Russian novel. And in addition to the three names that you have, the little nicknames can also connote uh, attitudes and um, so forth as well. So that's 
that's problem problematic, difficult. But here he um, uh, we meet her and we see something about him, and of course he. Uh, I think he's, he's fairly likable, and he danced now and then towards the evening with her, and it was principally during these dances that he won the heart of Praskovia Fyodorovna. She fell in love with him. Ivan Illich had no clearly defined intention of marrying, but when the girl fell in love with him, he put the question to himself, after all, why not get married, he said to himself. <laughs> We get the impression of a man who's a little bit narcissistic. He enjoys flirting with her, but he didn't flirt with her in order to marry her. But when she fell in love with him, then he thought about it. But he didn't think about it before. He thought about it after. This is characteristic of him, by the way. Now, the young lady, Praskovia Fyodorovna, was of good family, nice looking. There was a little bit of property. Ivan Illich might have reckoned on a more brilliant match, but this was a good match. Ivan Illich had his salary, she, he hoped, would have as much of her own. It was a good family. She was a sweet, pretty, and perfectly comme il faut young woman, as it must be. To say that Ivan Illich got married because he fell in love with his wife and found in her sympathy with his views of life would be as untrue as to say that he got married because the people of his world approved of the match. Ivan Illich was in influenced by both considerations. Note that none of them are that he loved the girl. He was doing what was agreeable to himself in securing such a wife, and at the same time doing what persons of higher standing looked upon as the correct thing. And Ivan Illich got married. So note that the narrator passes over the thing that I said to you. He didn't love her. It, it's, he says he married her because it was good for his profile and other people approved of it as well. But again, all of it's doing superficial things. There's no, uh, there's no substance in this man. Now the process itself of getting married in the early period of married life with the conjugal caresses, the new furniture, the new crockery, the new house linen, all up to the time of his wife's pregnancy went off very well so that Ivan Illich had already begun to think that so far from marriage breaking up that kind of frivolous, agreeable, light-hearted life, always decorous and always approved by society, which he regarded as the normal life, it would, be, it would even increase its agreeableness. But at that point, in the early months of his wife's pregnancy, there came in a new element, unexpected, unpleasant, tiresome, and unseemly, which could never have been anticipated, and from which there was no escape. His wife, without any kind of reason, it seemed to Ivan Illich, de gaite de coeur, gaite de coeur, for the sake of amusement, as he, de gaiety de coeur, began to disturb the agreeableness and decorum of their life. She began, without any sort of justification, to be jealous exacting in her demands on his attention, squabbled over everything, and treated him to the coarsest and most unpleasant scenes. At first, Ivan Illich hoped to escape from the unpleasantness of this position by taking up the same frivolous and well-bred line that had served him well on other occasions of difficulty. He endeavored to ignore his wife's ill humor, went on living lightheartedly and agreeably as before, invited friends to play cards, tried to get away himself to the club or to his friends. But his wife began on one occasion with such energy, abusing him in such coarse language and so obstinately persist, persisted in her abuse of him every time he failed in carrying out her demands, obviously having made up her mind firmly to persist till he gave way. That is, stayed at home and was as dull as she was. That Ivan Illich took alarm. He perceived that matrimony, at least with his wife, was not invariably conducive to the pleasures and proprieties of life, but on the contrary, often destructive of them, and that it was therefore essential to erect some barrier to protect himself from these disturbances. 
and Ivan Illich began to look about for such means of protecting himself. His official duties were the only thing that impressed Praskovia Fyodorovna, and Ivan Illich began to use his official position and the duties arising from it in his struggle with his wife to fence off his own independent world apart. So what do we observe here? And I'm going to conclude with this. Remember at the end of his life, he's screaming for three days and she closes three doors to keep her fence her off from him. This is exactly what he did to his wife. When she was pregnant and wanted more from him and wanted him to dote on her, be around, be more apart, but above all to be grounded, to be stuck in the marital home and be around the house, he found it like a prison and he sought to escape it and he sought it to escape it through prison, through uh, um, being dutiful, doing his job. So he, wh what he's doing is he's escaping, uh, avoiding not only his death, but his life by doing his duty, by doing his job. And he's avoiding the person with whom he's married. Right? So it's a very poignant description, I think, of what actually happens often in busy relationships. They're avoiding um, the most important thing. So, but we're giving a little character sketch of Ivan Illich here, and of his wife for that matter. But I, I think it's powerfully presented and plausible, and in some ways recognizable. He's talking about the human, uh, and the one thing he doesn't do is he does not sacrifice his own interests for his wife. He's a totally selfish individual, totally self-absorbed. Uh, he goes to work not because he loves his work, not because he loves the law, but because it allows him to escape responsibility and acting upon it. Right? So you, we get a sense of a port. That's how he begins things. And we'll, we'll find and we'll pick it up next uh, class, uh, going through the rest of the novella, having laid the groundwork, with seeing how this, he continues on this pattern, but of, of alienating himself from his very own uh, wife uh, with the fall. And the fall then changes everything. Uh, at that point, his mortality, he can't escape. The pain draws him down. And to some degrees, it, it imprisons him, not first of all within his house and then eventually on his bed. And that is transformed. And we'll look at Gerasim and the relation there, so forth. But I'll pick it up next time, okay?